thank you all for uh, being here. Uh, I just want to do a quick plug for Slido. We're going to take some questions at the end. So um, what is it, Slido? They, thank you. So feel free to, to throw any questions that you have about workplace culture. We're so lucky to have these um, two men here. I wanted, I know, Mohammed, you get a great introduction. But I actually don't know if people know what you guys do. So do, do you mind, uh, Samir, telling us a little bit, what, what does SunGrid do? Like, what is, what is your product? What kind of company? Yeah, sure. Uh, so SendGrid, um, it's a cloud-based uh, email platform. Uh, we send pretty staggering numbers, 50 billion emails per month on behalf of 82,000 paying customers spam around the world. Uh, and only wanted mail. We actually fire That's um, not spam. extraordinary numbers, uh, percentages of customers every month that try to get onto our system to send spam or fish, and we won't, we won't allow them. Um, so it is, uh, it's wanted mail. Um, where we started was mostly transactional mail. So if you uh, click on a forgot my password button, there's code that sits behind that that then sends an automated email into your inbox. Um, if you click a buy button um, or, you know, common use cases, if you get out of an Uber, uh, that receipt that shows up in your inbox is being delivered by SendGrid or your Airbnb confirmation, a Hertz reservation uh, confirmation, uh, all, all manner of, um, kind of automated transactions like that, a Spotify recommended playlist. We're in all of your inboxes every single day and actually from the brands you know and love. We're about 20 billion of those emails daily, <laughs> comparably, <laughs> uh, I'm certain of it. But we're essentially a company that's focused on workplace transparency, really advocating for the employee experience there, but focusing it a little bit differently by ensuring that we take more of a quantitative approach to the employee experience making sure that companies get to tell their story through their different employees' experience. And then I think the most exciting aspect of it is job seekers can actually drill down on our site what it's like for men to work at a company or women to work at a company or engineers, product design, and really put themselves in the shoes of what their experience might be like when they join a company. So it helps them find that culture fit out there. And you know, luckily, SendGrid is one of our customers, and, and right now, you know, serving about 14,000 companies, mainly focused in the U.S., but expanding uh, overseas in the next year or so. So I think that's uh, so unique. I, I mean, I have to ask this question since Comparably focuses on culture. What, I guess in one, could you describe in one word what Comparably, um, I'll, I'll give you a couple words. Like, what's the culture like <laughs> at, at Comparably? Like, because you guys focus so much on outside culture. Yeah. Um, how would you kind of describe it? Yeah, so I, I mean, it, just like most startup folks here, it, it's a bit hard charging. But I, I think the key, you know, I couldn't go look Samir and his team in the face or, or the countless other companies that we work with and it not be transparency, right? And so consistently, we have evolved as a company. And I, I used to think, and I was talking about this with Samir just a few minutes ago, Transparency to me talked about the, the C-level team sharing the board deck or financial position. And what I've learned over the last you know, five years or so is transparency is, is not just top down, but it's side to side, it's bottoms up. It's about truth seeking. And it's about making sure that we have conversations to get to the best decision that we possibly can. And our culture is like that. Are we always perfect about it? No. You know, but we really try and everybody that we have today and everybody that we bring on, we want those folks that can respectfully uh, disagree and, and dissent and bring new voices to the table. Is there any like, I guess we love hacks. So is there any hack that you've like enforced to kind of bring this thing to the bottom up, like helping with that? Uh, yeah, I, I, I actually held a round table in, in San Francisco last night and, and this isn't our hack, but I, I'm actually going to adopt it. So they lit there was a company that was talking about what they do to do this. And what they do is in every meeting when they're talking about a product or a major decision, they actually have one person that's assigned to be the voice of the customer. And no matter what happens in that discussion, they are constantly the voice of the customer. And whether you know, they rotate it around, whether they you know, believe that opinion or not, it still always adds a different voice to every single discussion. And, and I think a great hack that 
you know, I'm going to start adopting tomorrow. Oh, yeah, that sounds like a great hack. So um, you have all this data on all these companies. Why don't you dish a little bit on what SendGrid is like on Comparably? Uh, God, like, I what wish are the reviews I, yeah, like? I, I wish I had, I had all the bad stuff, you know, but the reality is almost 50% of SendGrid's current employees, and that's one of the way we differentiate is we really focus on people that are there today, have left feedback about their experience at SendGrid. I think one of the really most notable things, right, is 75% of their employees say that they receive on a weekly or monthly feedback, on a weekly or monthly basis, valuable feedback about their professional growth, their career development. Even more than that, right, 75% said they receive valuable feedback from their manager on a daily or weekly basis. And then, you know, kind of even go a little further, 91% said they feel comfortable giving their manager negative feedback. You know, everything that I was talking about from a culture, that transparency, that difficult discussion, you know, I think that really comes out of what your employees are saying and, and a pretty significant number about their experience. Yeah, that's really impressive, Samir. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to know the backstory. But before you go into I want to give you a first a congratulations. I don't know if you guys know this, um, but Twilio just got acquired by, I'm sorry, SendGrid just got acquired by Twilio. <laughs> so congratulations, yeah, first off. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and thank you. now I want to know the backstory of the numbers, which I'm pretty sure led to the acquisition and everything. Like, there's got to be, <laughs> it's like, It's all something the there. culture numbers well, on Comparable. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I, uh, I'd say a couple things. I guess, one, first off, thank you for the congratulations. Um, uh, I really am deeply excited about the combination of these two businesses. Um, Twilio and Sengrid have been sort of kindred spirits living in parallel universes. Um, what I just described that we do on the email side, they've been doing on the SMS or messaging side and, and with voice and video. Um, both with this developer-led go-to-market model. We serve startups and, and um, the builders of the world, as we like to say. So, um, so it's an extraordinary company. I'm, I'm extraordinarily proud and, uh, and humbled to hear the, the one in particular that I love is that 91% of our teammates feel like they can provide uh, direct, critical, negative feedback to their manager. I think that is, um, to your point about transparency, um, uh, just critical to build the kind of environment where everybody is there to do their best work. Everybody believes that they are um, on a single team with a common goal and a mission, and uh, that this notion of of hierarchy isn't one that is ever ever abused um, for for um, ill purposes. So I, I, what I love is that um, we we talk a lot at SendGrid about um, servant leadership, and and this notion that. You know, the, the CEO with the C-suite and then it cascades down into this uh, pyramid is just the wrong way of viewing the world, that it really is inverted and should be, you know, the, the executive team here at the bottom um, of the pyramid supporting all the people that actually do the hard work at the company every day. Uh, and I'll often say, you know, I, I don't have to take the angry customer um, support calls. I don't have a sprint to uh, deliver a... Now what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Uh, actually, and, I th and it's an important question um, because, you know, I don't have a quota to hit. I don't have lots of those things. I do feel, and, as, uh, and I know there are a lot of entrepreneurs and CEOs in the room, um, we do have a great deal of responsibility and accountability uh, to steer. And so I, if you liken it to uh, uh, being in a boat, like you want everybody in your boat aligned and you're rowing in the same direction, we've got the rudder, right? As the CEO or as the leader of the company, you've got the rudder. Um, appreciate you're not doing the hard rowing of the company. The people that are rowing and doing the hard work are actually out in front. And be supportive of them and be grateful for them and thank them. Um, but know that you've got to make the right calls. Are we in the right markets? Are we... Are we competitively well positioned? Are we differentiated? Do we have the right capital structure? Can we hire the, do we have the right leadership team in place? Do we have the right members of the team? Do we have the right culture on our boat to be able to get to where we need to go? Does everybody on our boat know exactly where we're going? Are we aligned? We have tons of responsibility, but it's at the back of the boat. And, and so I think just that notion is, is super important. And the fact that 91% say, I can tell my manager uh, if there are things that are impeding me from doing my best work every day, um, that, I believe, actually is correlated to the success of our business, which is correlated to the why we just got acquired for $3 billion. Crazy. $3 billion. That's with a B, guys. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm going to have to ask you this. Oh, uh, how, the, how big is your team? The company, uh, SendGrid, is 450 people. 
that's pretty amazing. Um, I, I'm gonna have to ask you what what's been that they call it a hack. What what's been that big thing to help keep it all? You know, you talk about the not you, but when we talk about cultures, all these fuzzy like accountability, yeah. responsibility, all of that. Like, but what's been that hack of enforcing that and helping it? Like, uh, don't get me wrong, I, I do believe you have to have that belief set, and yeah. then you have to live it out. Um, yeah. You know, culture's caught, not taught, right? Like, yeah. so. What, what are some of the things that you guys have done that help enforce this? Yeah, I, I think the key for, for us uh, and the success we've had in scaling it, right? I mean, so like when I joined the company, we were, I don't know, remember 100, 150 people. Um, and, and so as we, as we continue to scale, culture gets very hard to scale. It's actually reasonably easy to keep a tight culture when it's 10 or 15 of you in a, in a, you know, in a single small office. You can check one another in terms of the behaviors and the... Um, the values that any one of your teammates is exhibiting at any given point in time. It's when there's not that um, immediate um, kind of the culture keepers watching, so to speak. Are, are we actually living our values? It's easy. It, actually, it's not easy to write it down. First off, got to write it down. And, and I would just encourage all the startup <laughs> leaders and entrepreneurs in the room, um, definitely be thoughtful about it and write it down. Um, uh, my new CEO, uh, Jeff Lawson at Twilio, I think says it well, where he, he says, you know, writing it down is really about us observing and cataloging and writing down the way we actually work. It's like, it's hard to, it doesn't actually usually go the other way of saying, we want to work like this and there, it's, you know, you, your culture is who you, who you are, who's there, and, and your team and how you work together. But um, uh, the, the way that uh, we have been able to scale that is by operationalizing it. So this is, I think, the big key. If you want to have, you can write it down and put them up on the wall. That's half the battle. Um, they will unfortunately stay on the wall mm -hmm. if you don't operationalize. What I mean by operationalize, I mean, how does it literally manifest itself in the day-to-day -day activities of uh, members of, of the company you're bringing in? So uh, we literally took the employee experience and the journey and say, okay, every teammate, from the first time they touch us, how do they know that we live and care deeply about these values? So we start with recruiting. Uh, we have uh, our, our core values at SendGrid prior to the acquisition, we had these four H's, happy, hungry, humble, and honest. And those four H's were, um, we'd take each one of the four, and there'd be an interview loop, and each one of the interviewers, okay, you take happy, you take hungry, you take humble, you take honest, and they would interview the, um, the candidate uh, at the end of the content, uh, the content-driven part of the interview, on one of those H's, and they would ask things like, on the humble H, we would say, you know, please, you know, uh, tell us a little bit about the most, um, the the accomplishment in your career you are most proud of, and then you would sit back and do a pronoun count, and listen for how many times they said I versus we, and that would tell you just about everything you needed to know on on their orientation towards humility, and um, and so we had questions like that, so the candidate knew from day one. Uh, before day one, day negative 60, that we cared a lot about our culture and our values. They would show up on um, uh, at the company, and we have new employee orientation, and I spend an hour with every new employee um, group that comes into the company. I still do this at 450 in scale, and we talk a lot about our culture and our values and why it matters, and I implore everyone there to be a culture keeper and to, to realize it's not everybody else's job, but it's all of our jobs, because there's no one person um, you know, if you believe that a culture is simply the sum of every interaction that exists between every employee in the company and every hallway, every conference room, et cetera, you know, no one person is going to be present for more than 0.0001% of all those interactions. So you, you get them engaged there. We do 4-H awards on a quarterly basis. People nominate, and you put up videos of people when they win, um, of the people that nominated them, explaining why it is so amazing to work with somebody who lives our values. And so it's it's that, and that's what I mean by operationalizing. It's you actually, it's it's visible. You see it in the workplace. It, you know, one thing that I think is really unique, and you can see this on comparably about SendGrid's culture, and actually you can just go to their site and and see it from their executive team. That is really unique in the tech space. You have a really good diversity of women in in, in your company, and even more so, all the numbers that I talked about earlier about feedback about. Um, you know, uh, really conversations in the workspace. Typically at companies, and I see this again and again, not only did you overall score, you know, 10, 20% higher than the average is out there, companies your size and some very, uh, you know, considerably larger, but the, 
the significance between what the female experience and male experience that, that they're having at SendGrid, there's a minimal difference in those numbers. Awesome. And, and, and what almost any other company, whether it's, yeah, I won't name them, but uh, other company out there, those differences can be extremely significant. We all struggle with that yeah. uh, in the tech world. So it, it's kudos to you and what you've doing, done from an opera operation of that that's Thanks. gonna be like part two of this yeah thank you <laughs> and, and we love that there. we care so deeply about diversity and inclusion and believe deeply that it's it's part of the success formula you got to have uh, a, a broad group of folks involved. and it's not just yeah. diversity of it, we always talk about it as diversity of um uh certainly gender of ethnicity but uh and orientation and on and on and on and thought and perspective and because we're all unique creatures. That's right. Well, you guys have, have a couple of great questions, and I want us to get to some of them. Um, any advice or learnings in terms of scaling transparency as the team grows? This is a, this is a good one. Well, I, one, one thing I would just throw, um, throw out there is um, having, for us, a language, a vocabulary in your company that allows for it. So I mentioned our four H's. One of those is honest. And we have like two sentences that describe what each of those H's mean. For honest, one of them is transparency. And so you will very often hear in a hard conversation like Mike was talking about, a preface of, hey, Mike, I got to give you some honest H feedback. And the second one of our, our teammates hears honest H, we got to have an honest H conversation. They know that uh, this is something that is coming from a good place. Like when you're invoking the value of the company, it's not going to be about, you're not trying to be a jerk, you're not trying to be mean, or you're coming from a good place, you care, either about the person or the team or the company, and you're going to share some honest and uh, transparent feedback, and that's really important. I love how it's like woven into your language that they actually call it like an honest H or yeah. a humble H. Do they ever say, I need a humble H conversation? <laughs> well, you will like literally hear in conference rooms, Okay, that's not very humble age of us. <laughs> <laughs> you will. You'll hear people say that. Where are my guys at? That? I know some of my people. That's um, true. I, I, we'll take one about comparably. How does comparably make money? Um, how do you avoid being uh, an employer branding a propaganda? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think that's yeah. that, that's always a balance for us. I mean, you know, there's the the way that we make money right now is companies get the chance to participate on our site and they will pay us to really collect data from their team members. Um, how do we differentiate from folks so it's just not a marketing page is we really do try and go get significant data. Like I said, 50% of SendGrid's teams of current employees are leaving feedback. We do so in an anonymous way from their team. We do so in a data collective way from their team. There is no company on our site that has great ratings across the board. It's near impossible. All of us need to improve in various exactly. segments. And I think one of the ways that we make sure that we don't become an employer brand site is because we look at companies 18 different ways and there's not one that really does that excellent across the board. And so there is that consistency of, I'd say a more authentic voice that comes from who's there today. No, that totally makes sense. Um, there was this one question that came up and popped off, but I think it's actually a very good one. It was, what's the role of HR and, and leadership in culture? Because you talk, both of you are talking about how everybody's a culture keeper, um, and then so oftentimes companies will just say, oh, throw this to HR. Oh, you need HR. Like, mm -hmm. how do you guys work together? Because HR does do a lot of execution things as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I would just say there that... Um while everyone needs to be um, a steward of the culture, a protector and defender and, uh, of the culture, uh, without question, those that are in leadership and those that are in the people function have to be um, uh, bellwethers of the culture. They have to, you live in a, in a very large fishbowl, and if your actions are, not, are deviating from or not reinforcing of those values, it's just not authentic. It, just, it will fall flat, it, your culture will not scale if those two groups of people in particular are not living the values every day. And I think Samir's key there, as he just said, is, is historically a lot of these things have come, in, come out of HR and they still do at companies. And, and so the idea of this is a business strategy. 
this is critical to the business and making that part of the leadership team brings HR into feeling a part of that. They're not the, you know, distant cousin in, in this process and really does make that part of that constant alignment. I mean, we talk about culture as competitive advantage. Like this is, this is core to our strategy um, and, and has been. And you can look at our uh, ability to attract talent, retain talent, develop talent. Uh, as, and it, it's uh, absolutely been a, a big part of why we've been successful and why I believe we'll continue to be successful. Awesome. Well, um, we're pretty much out of time. <laughs> um, <laughs> so thank you, everybody, for all of your questions. Um, and thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Holly. Thanks, Samir. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Holly.